Hello, I'm Pastor Brian, and I want to thank you so much for joining me as we look into God's Word to see His timeless truth. How do you view the government around us? What is your thoughts concerning them? Thinking that, all right, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ, then our, 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 our kingdom is in heaven. We're aliens. We're strangers. But yet, we are still here. We're still in the midst of people. Christ has not returned. We're still desiring to want God's word to go out. So how we listen and obey the government, does it matter if it's a good government or a bad government? Well, we'll look into some of those things as Romans chapter 13, 1 through 7 addresses that. Before we dig in any further, let's go ahead and go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, help me have the right words to say, and those that are listening have hearts and ears to hear, Lord, of how we should view the governing authorities. It's in your name we do pray. Amen. All right, here in Romans chapter 13, we are going to be looking at how should we view ourselves in light of the government which is over us, that has authority over us. So if you're living in the United States, how do you view the government that's over you? How do you view your local government, those that are put in authority over you? Does it change how we respond if they're good, if they're mediocre, or if they're really bad? How does that change how we engage and interact? Remember, we are right in the kind of nearing the end of Romans, but we have been through Romans 11 where it talked about the mercies of God in which he has given us. So Paul is talking to believers based upon the salvation that we have in God, knowing that we are servants of God. God has the right to guide and direct our lives. And so last time we were looking at how do we engage with people? How do we love our enemies? and not do evil towards them, and that's a hard thing to do. Well, today will be a reminder of, really, what does it look like for you to engage and interact with the government that's around us, knowing that of what God says of it will shape and change maybe how you view those that are in authority over you. And understand that I think this carries on as we continue on as how to respond to those who do evil to you, but how do you respond to the government in the understanding that we are called to live peaceably with all, if possible, and that we know that living in such a way is for God's glory to be known, for the gospel message to go out for that purpose. So, I would think right here as we're looking in here in the book of Romans that individuals there kind of understood what it meant to be in a position where the government doesn't think too highly of them, especially if they're Jewish. And so uh, Paul's probably addressing people that were viewing the government wrongly. And so he's giving this correction and helping them think about how they should view government. Now, keep in mind that they're no strangers to the Roman Empire, not necessarily treating them the best. And later on, in the time by the time Peter kind of is writing his letter, that we really see that uh, during that time, Nero was just crazy. And he was really coming after the Christians um, and really uh, wanting them. In fact, there had been times when they had been kicked out of of certain areas. And so, again, they were having to pay taxes that Rome, Roman citizens weren't paying. And so all of this probably factors in as he's addressing the church in Rome and how they are supposed to relate to others. And perhaps even the last couple of years, maybe your view of government has changed. And how do you still just, I think this is even a reminder for me of how to view things and really understand that some of their issues where they were thinking, all right, 
uh, our kingdom is in heaven. So we don't, we don't have to regard this uh, ruler over us to any regards. And well, we'll see what um, uh, Paul has to say. Or they think about the idea that why should we place ourselves under this government and because it's not a Jewish government, probably coming back from the idea in the Old Testament where they were looking for a, a Jewish leader. And so maybe they're thinking, well, why should we do this? And the Roman government does evil, so why should we give money to that? They're not helping us. And, and so all of these factors come in. And I think some of the same things come into our mind as well. And so th there were probably a number of them that weren't good Roman or good citizens in the city of Rome. And uh, I think we could fall into the same situation. But let's go ahead and kind of dig in to see how our response really takes factor into all of this. So it says this. Uh, and this is kind of the first part, it is kind of the thesis of all of this, and then we'll kind of revisit that later on. But it says this, let every person, so, so he's talking to Christian, be subject to the governing authorities. All right, so we are supposed to be, in a sense, put our, place ourselves under their rule, under their authority. Now, it says authorities, and some people have said this is referring to angelic. I don't necessarily think it's, uh, I think it's more civil, and, 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 and it could be some, but I, I don't see that. So what I see is it is saying, all right, to the, because he's talking about the practical side of things in, in a lot of ways, and so he's talking about kind of the, those that are in Rome. How do you view those that are over you? And, and have that authority. And it says, be subject to them. Put yourselves under them. So obey what they say. And this is probably what, where it says for, and that for is saying, let me give a reason. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist uh, have been instituted by God. And so what we see kind of in all of this is that idea of we are called to place ourselves in subjection under authority. And I think the first things that comes to our mind is what if they're calling us to do something contrary to the word of God? Well, I think the best place to kind of look at that or to think of that is saying, all right, understanding he's not saying the quality of government, but we know from Acts 4 as well as Acts 5.29 where it talks about it and, and Peter's saying, hey, they're saying, hey, don't preach the word. And, and the response is, we must obey God rather than man. And so Acts uh, for kind of 18 through 20 in Acts 5, 29, we just see that that call to really follow after God is higher than the governing authorities, but we really have to be careful in how we kind of view some of that in that, yes, we oftentimes want to make arguments for ourselves as why we don't have to obey something or why we don't have to do something, and we uh, make allowances that scripture doesn't allow. But when it comes to a clear case of if the government asks you to sin, don't sin. Don't go against God. And so that those things are clear. And again, we can see that even those governments that are evil, God's against them and God will cause judgment to come upon them. In Psalm 34, 16, it says, The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Uh, to cut them off uh, the memory of them from the earth. And so we see that those that are in authority, those that do wrong, that God doesn't like it. He, he doesn't care for them. And God, that God has a purpose. Think even back to the Assyrians and the Babylonians. God used wicked people to bring about his purposes that people would come to know him, to, to, to discipline them. And so we also see in Isaiah 520, it says this, Woe to those who call 
evil good and good evil. All right, and it continues going on. But ultimately, what we see is that we are to honor the things of what God says about against governing authorities. Now, we'll kind of get into this a little bit later. But yes, understand when he's talking about this, he's kind of strictly going, all right, this is a problem you have. You're not obeying the, the government, the authority that's over you. This is what you're called. So all Christians are called to do this. And he gives a reason that uh, no authority except from God, that God is sovereign. He is over all and everything is instituted by God. God does permit evil people to be in power. I mean, I think about even situations like with Saul. That, again, he didn't want them to choose that, but they wanted that. And so Paul goes, or God goes, all right, here, have Saul. And he obviously it caused problems. And um, it's not saying whether they're worthy or not as to how um, we're supposed to follow them. God put them in place. God is in control. So if you believe God is in control, we even understand that God... Uh, as we even looked at in the last couple of chapters of how God had allowed, uh, you know, kind of the Jews to rebel, that gent the gospel would go to the Gentiles, and then the gent uh, Jews will come ahead again and be presented with the gospel in a real and unique way. And so we see that all of this is instituted, planned out by God. And so at the core of what Paul is saying, trying to say is, this is God's heart. This is what he has. Uh, and so whether, whatever the president may be, whatever country you may be in, God has put that person in charge. And, and again, we don't know totally the plans of God and how he works things out, but we know that nothing gets away from God. Nothing is outside of God's view. And in that, we can say, all right, God, this is your call for my life. And our whole life is really a life of submission to God and his plan, because we are called to be a living sacrifice and to follow after him. And we understand the greater purpose is to make God's glory be known and the very fact that when we exercise our own judgment and, and try to um, do that, uh, you know, punishment upon maybe authorities, that we'll do it wrongly. Now, this doesn't mean that we need to be complete pacifists. I think if, if there's stuff that is going on, I think we need to be active and involved. We need to use the legal processes that we have before us to hold the leaders accountable. And so we should do what we should, you know, be involved to the extent that God has called you to be involved. Maybe that involves running for a position. Maybe that can involves financially contributing, whatever it may be. But understand that whomever is in place, God, it didn't, they didn't thwart God's plan. And so continues on. And it says this, therefore, whoever resist or is against uh, the authority uh, resist uh, what God has appointed and those who resist will incur judgment. So it says those who aren't following along, there will be punishment that will happen. It, it will, God's judgment will, uh, the first government's judgment will rest upon them and then God's judgment will rest upon them. Now, it's important to understand that when we run this through, we've got to see there are times when we just can't do it. And probably the, the examples that come to my mind are in Exodus, where we see that uh, the midwives weren't going to allow the babies to die and, and, and therefore even protecting Moses, that God would use Moses to uh, really to carry his word out. And so we see that, that they didn't obey because obviously killing is wrong. And then we also see uh, Daniel 3 with Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego uh, and then how they did not bow down and worship 
when they were called to, when the horn, when the trumpet was blown. And so what we see is that even in that, we have, when we do say, all right, this is God's call and it's not in line with what they're asking me to do, that there may be consequences. There may be punishment that received for that. But know that God, in the end, God will judge rightly. But if we're called to obey the governing authorities, and it isn't uh, against God, but we kind of shoehorn it in, then not only do we see, could we receive punishment from the local authorities, or, but ultimately from God, because he sees and knows what's right. And so we need to search the scriptures out, be prayerful about all of those kind of times. God will judge the wicked rulers rightly, and we have such a hard time at that. And one of the things that uh, we're even even think about is uh, Romans nine seventeen, where it said this: "For Scripture says to Pharaoh, for this per- very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show you my power in my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth." So God's purpose, even for Pharaoh was for the spread of, of his, his name. And again, God can do that again. And so we even see how God, even the, the wicked are captive to God's plan and God uses them. And so it says, don't, re- don't resist, you'll incur judgment. And so it continues on in verse three. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct but to bad. Now, th- this is a normal situation. If those that follow the governing rules go ahead and they do that, what we see is oh, you don't have anything to fear if you respond rightly to the government. And so if you if you don't respond correctly, you will have fear. And, and that's kind of where it gets into it as it continues on in verse 3. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? And again, think about that. We want authority because if there was no authority, and obviously God has established authority, what is it? It's either mob rule or anarchy. And mob rule and anarchy is no good. I mean, that that is terrifying to think about that. Um, so we, we, we obviously see that God has has used government. God has used plans. Even as you think about with Moses and all of those things, it's just how God has used governments and institutions and those in leadership positions for the purpose of protection. And that's normally what they're called to do. And so it continues on. It says, um, then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. Uh, this idea of approval is uh, be commended or praise. And so we're called to live out in such a way as to do good. Now, you can think about this, uh, and, and we do, then we go, man, it is hard to do this. They, they knew that it's hard to do this. They were living in a difficult situation. They, in fact, uh, I'm just going to pull it out right now, is just the very fact of if we look at Jesus in his life, what happened? He did nothing wrong. He sinned. He committed no sin. And they went ahead and they had this sham kind of hearings and all these things, and it ended up, to be, he was put on the cross when he did nothing wrong. So God knows that governing authorities make bad calls. I mean, just think about it. But God still had his son go to the cross so that each of us can receive salvation when we trust in him, that he was the one who paid the price. And so we underst- we're not unaware that God understands that there can be governing authorities that make wrong choices. Obviously, God doesn't make wrong choices. For he has put them in place. And, and ultimately, understand that that person in that authoritative position, he is God's servant. It says that right here in verse 4. For he 
is God's servant, a tool to be used for our for social order, for our good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. And again, he's talking about this idea of human judgment that will come upon us, also paired with the fact that God is ultimately going to judge. For he, be afraid, for he does not uh, bear the sword in vain. That the idea of sword is almost the idea of capital punishment, that uh, he, he, they have the authority to deal with uh, those who disobey in the way that they see fit, even, I would say, here, as it talks about probably even to death. And so that's what we see, that God has instituted them for that. And again, as believers, we've trusted in the Lord. And what's the worst they could do? I mean, they kill us when we go to heaven. I mean, think about that. Not a not a bad plan. And so uh, understand that God has them in place. For he is the servant of God. An avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. And, and the idea is the, uh, of avenger, the, a minister, an agent, one who is used by God to carry out uh, judgment. And so we see that ultimately we know that God is the ultimate judge and that we have to live our lives uh, knowing that. And so even in that, we see that he, this whole situation, remember how I was talking about Jesus uh, before Pilate? Let's kind of look at that. And it says in John 19, 10 and 11, so Pilate said to him, you will not uh, speak to me? And so he, Jesus is in front of uh, Pilate and he's questioning him. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at, at all unless it has been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over all to you has uh, the greater sin. And so understand that he's saying God is in charge. His father is in charge of all of this. And that we understand that when God is in control, we can submit ourselves to the governing authorities because ultimately we know that God will right every wrong and he wants us to live peaceably for the gospel to go forth and for people to know who he is and to live for him. All right, now verse five continues on. It kind of summarizes the same thing, but it gives us five ways in which we're supposed to make sure we're living this out correctly. So in verse five, it starts with a therefore, kind of this, uh, this idea. Let me go ahead and summarize this. One must... Uh, be uh, in subjection, not to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. So what we have is that our conscience, we, we, we have this compel, compulsion inside that we must, our, our own consciousness is, should compel us to follow the law. And perhaps you've been in that situation. Perhaps you've been in a situation where you broke the law. Nobody was around. Nobody caught you. But you're like, I need to make it right because I know I sinned. I knew I did something wrong. As believers, really what we want to do is live a life that is above reproach. We want to live better than those that are non-Christians. We want to live in such a way that God's can use us to be a witness that he has called us to live in a different way and in a different manner. And so we must be in subjection. We, we must line up uh, under it. Uh, and uh, not only to, and this is the first call it is, avoid God's wrath. So understanding that God's going to judge us re regardlessly uh, of how we kind of feel about things, but he's going to make the right judgment. Uh, so not only that, um, he says, but also for the sake of conscience. 
Now, here he's talking about that, that idea that inner part of us that, that, uh, keeps us from, keeps us to do right and not to do wrong, um, that, that is kind of directing us, guiding us, um, and helps us to understand this. I think part of the difficulty comes is we don't have everything spelled out. Perhaps we have an authority figure where they're breaking the law and maybe the Constitution or something uh, or another bill or something says this is what they're supposed to follow and they're not doing that. So who am I to listen? Maybe one person in authority is saying this and another person in authority is saying that and they're contradictory. Uh, how do you deal with those things? And those are real things. I mean, and, and how we kind of work that out. Out. And especially when there is untruthfulness from different leaders, we got to go, all right, how, how am I supposed to live this out? Who should I listen to when there's conflicting authorities? I think 1 Corinthians 4.4 4, uh, kind of explains that best. For I am not unaware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. So when we make that call about, am I going to, who am I going to follow if there's conflicting ideas or, or something else is in the mix? First off, we need to go before the Lord with it. Lord, what would you have me to do? And know that even here, he thought, all right, I, I don't see anything wrong. I don't think I'm doing wrong. But just because you don't feel like you're doing wrong doesn't mean you don't do wrong. And ultimately, uh, if you feel like you're not doing wrong and you are doing wrong, God's going to judge you for that wrong thing that you did. So I think even in situations where it's hard to know, I think we got to be prayerful and mindful of that, that our desires in our mind is, all right, how can I follow authority? Not the first thing that comes up is, how can I avoid the authority or how can I get around or how can I subvert? No, that that's not what God has us to do. He says, all right, first do this, but if it is against God, and, and, and sometimes it's kind of kind of hard to figure out, and we have a clear conscience about that, understand, okay, go with that, but God might view it differently, and we'll have to stand in judgment that. But so so do it according to your conscience. And then he goes ahead and he continues to give other ideas of how they need to be living life out and, and being subject to the authorities. For be, because of this, you also pay taxes. All right. Uh, and and there, as it's going to talk here, it's going to talk about taxes and then revenue. This taxes that it's talking about is that which um, the non-Roman citizens had to pay. The Roman citizens didn't have to pay this, but everybody, when we come down to revenue, that's where everybody has to pay. And that's more in regards to things like sales tax and, and toll taxes and different things like that. But just the general taxes to the government uh, is saying, all right, not a Roman citizen, you, you got to pay that. It, it doesn't matter uh, what they do. And he said, but what if they don't use it for a good purpose? What if they use it? I mean, think about it. They, again, they've tried to change this and all that and, 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 and all that. But what if you say, all right, I can't give taxes because they use that for abortions and I don't want to pay for abortions. Nobody does. I mean, obviously there are some, but hopefully as a believer, you don't want to have that paid for and, and, and be paying for that. And so, what you what you say is, all right, this is what God has called me to do. And if I give that and they wrongly mismanage it or wrong give it to a wrong thing, then that's God's judgment upon them. You don't have to worry about it. You do what you're called to do, and then God will judge them for what they are doing. But we're called to pay taxes. Uh, and again, it's he says, for giving that reason, for the authorities uh, or, or rulers are ministers of God. 
attaining to this very thing. All right, that that's what they're called to do. You you give unto Caesar what is Caesar, and, and we'll kind of get into that in a little bit. But let's go ahead and, and look at the other one. Pay to all who is owed to them taxes to whom taxes are owed. All right. So it, it, we need to understand that that is a debt that is owed to them in that uh, and we might not think it's fair, but again, we can fight it in legal manners, but we're still called to do that. Uh, and then it continues on and it says, revenue to whom revenue is owed. And when you think about the particular time when the Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus and they said, all right, who should we get, who should, should you pay um, taxes to Caesar? And they were trying to trap him. And, and, and he says, well, whose face is on it? And it's Caesar's. And so he says, all right, give to Caesar what is Caesar and God what is God. And so understanding that even in that, God says, all right, this may not be fair, may not be right, but what we are, we're subject to those authorities and we live our lives out that way. And so, like I said, the revenue is more like sales tax and, and, and toll taxes that everybody had to do. And so we should be law-abiding citizens. Um, and it goes on, it says, respect to whom respect is, is given. We are to restrain, restrain ourselves from breaking the law. We are supposed to give reverence, give a sense of awe to, to those who are in those positions because of their position. I mean, think about that. Uh, there's a lot of times when you don't like the call that the person up top makes. And guess what? That person in that position gets to make that call. And so we can make an appeal, but we've got to be respectful and honorable in that. And we can't just um, backbite, turn, gossip, all, all that about them because they are the one in authority. They are the one in position. So again, if there's an issue of sin, yeah, we're called to call out that sin. But we still need not cross over the line of not being respectful or not honoring them. And that's what it says in this fifth one that he says is honor to whom honor is owed. And understand all of this. They, they knew that. They, God knows that there are evil men in charge with evil policies, but we're still supposed to give them the respect of that position that is owed to them. And Peter knew that. I mean, let me think, uh, there are two, I guess, main examples. So this isn't the only place of scripture, but two other prominent places is in Titus 3.1, where it says this, remind them to be submissive to the ruler and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. So there, and not only that, in 1 Peter uh, 2, uh, 13 and 14, and again, Nero, Nero was full on evil then. Um, again, so he says this, be a subject to, or be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, and so like Nero, or to governing or governors as servant or as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. So we are called to live honorably. We're called to live God. We're called to live in such a way that God is exalted because we understand that he is in control of all things and there's no leader or person in position that has subverted God's plan, but God's plan for us is to live it peaceably, if all possible, with individuals and in that understanding that it is for a greater purpose that as believers, 
as ones who have received the mercies of God, we desire that the word goes forth and in that God is glorified and he is made known that some might come to know the Lord and how we live our lives. That we understand there may be trials and tribulations. In fact, we're told that trials and tribulations will come and ultimately... We are, our authority that is directed to us is ultimately from God. So if there's a call to sin or to, to do evil, we don't do that. But if it is not, we are called to submit ourselves under that authority and in that to live to the glory of God in which he has called us. Again, just as loving your enemy is hard, this can be hard. And so it, it, we don't have excuse not to do it. But we're called to live this way out because even, even modeled to us by Jesus on the cross, that that is how God works out his plan and how God uses even the wicked to achieve his purposes so that he may be known. And so in that I think we just need to go for, to, before God and ask God for help in helping us to live this out. So let's go ahead, go ahead before him in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, help us to live this out. Help us to live in such a way that you are exalted. Help us to rightly discern uh, maybe if the government is asking, asking us to do sinful things, that we don't do that, that we would live in such a way that we follow your commands, that we do such a thing that we are, are glorifying you. And so, Lord, help us in all of these difficult situations that we have faced and we will be facing, at Lord, and help us through those to live in such a way that we give them honor, but ultimately that you are glorified. It's in your name we do pray. Amen. So I want to thank you so much for taking time to go through God's word with me and be blessed.